So hello and welcome to Lewis Nichols Live Stories in association with Shane Solomon. And I'm really excited for this one. Um, we're joined by the incredible Cheryl Baker. How Yay! are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you very much. You're here in and Cornwall. And obviously incredible because you I, just said You are incredible and you're here in a land of make-believe in Cornwall. So. <laughs> oh, well done. Well done. Is this the one you're going to carry on? How, how was the journey? We were just talking about you actually flew into Newcastle and you've never done that before. Never flown to Cornwall, didn't even know you could and it was the way to go and I don't think I'm ever going to drive here again. Obviously I will. But um, yeah, it was fantastic. Shane Flight can arrange wonderful. you flights anytime. Don't worry, just message Shane and he'll make that happen. Eastern Airways, <laughs> thank you very much. It was great. Um, today's kind of a bit of a life story. So we're going to start from the beginning, kind of your love of music to, to where you're at now. My uh, life story. We are. You haven't got love enough. <laughs> we'll do it in three episodes. Um, but where did your love of music come from? You know, when you were growing up, did you, did you kind of grow up around music with your family? My mum, my mum sang to me all the time. She sang some strange songs, but... <laughs> like what? Oh, like what? Okay, <laughs> like, I mean, creepy songs, to be perfectly honest. She sang, I mean, she sang lovely songs and a lot of war songs because I was 54, I was born, so it was kind of post-war, you know. And um, But she also, she had some weird songs. She had an Irish mum and uh, a Jewish dad, not sure where he came from, and so she would sing If You're Irish, Come Into the Parlour, and then she would sing My Yiddish Mama. But then she would sing these weird songs like um, um, Blood Stains on the Carpet, Blood Stains on the Knife. Oh, Dr. Oh. Mark Ruxton, <laughs> you murdered your wife. She did. She did. And, I mean, there's more. There's so many more. And I, and I thought, where did she get these from? But I've Googled them and they are songs. I'd be terrified. So, <laughs> I know, I know. And there was the one, you know, he's a little boy that Santa Claus forgot. And I used to go, oh, mummy, mummy, tell me that Santa did come in the end. And she used to have to make up another another verse yeah. where, yeah, there's um, there was some good stuff. But she sang all the time. She sang all the time. And she was one of 11 and they all used to sing in the pubs because in those days... You know, you couldn't be a singer on telly because there was no telly. Yeah. Because my mum was born in 1915. So um, so they used to sing at the pub at the end of the road, which is actually what I thought I'd probably end up doing. Um, and and her and her sisters used to go up and sing harmonies and things. And, that, and so I think it's all down to my mum, really. And did you always know that, that I'm going to do this as a career? Kind of early on, did you just know it was your calling? I knew that I was going to sing. But as I just said, I expected it to be. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a singer in a band and I really wanted to win Eurovision after Sandy Shaw won in 67. But I knew that probably that wasn't going to happen to me because I was an ordinary girl living in a council flat. Uh, I, I, th I knew that probably I would end up singing in the pub or, you know, just, just of a weekend and I would have a proper job, which I trained for at school, which was secretarial. And then look at where you're at now. I mean, you said about wanting to win Eurovision, but a lot of people probably won't know. Before Bucks Fizz, you actually represented the UK in Eurovision with a different band. Yeah. Um, is it Coco? Yeah, Coco. So tell us about that. Was it 1978? Eight. So yeah. we all know you for Eurovision, of course, making your mind up, but then you did it before. So mm. what was your first experience like with Eurovision and Coco? Um, I'm going to take you back further so that you know how yeah. I got into Coco. Because it was 1975 and I worked for an Israeli and as happens with Israel, there was a threat of a war and he went back to Israel because he was a reservist. And I went into work and it was the company was me and him. That was it. I went into work, typewriter, no computers in those days, and there was a note on my computer from Joshua saying that he'd gone back to Israel and I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I can't, I can't run the company on my own. And, um, and I... As always, I bought the the enemy and the melody maker, to, and I always looked at the situations vacant, singers wanted. And this particular week, it said, singer wanted for harmony band, must have experience. That's the bit I lacked. You know, I had no experience, but I love harmony. And um, I went, I auditioned for this band. At the time, they were called Mother's Pride. And I got the job. I don't know how, but I got the job. And I went back into the office on the Monday morning and Joshua was there. Hooray, he's back from Israel. Whoa. I went, hey, Josh, <laughs> I want to leave. I've got to join my, this band. And he went, okay. So I left that very day. 
And on the Tuesday, I packed my case and everything. I'd never been, I'd never been anywhere in my life, you know. Bethel Green, East London, was my my little cocoon. Um, and I got on a bus and I went up to Blackpool where the band were working, and that was my first professional job. And then three years later, as you say, we'd changed oh. our name by then to Coco, and we did the Eurovision Song Contest for the first time. And um, but did you know? That in 1976 was, which was about three or four months after I first started singing with them. It was February 1976. I did my first song for Europe. Is that the year Brotherhood yeah. won it? Yeah. Wow. We came second. We lost by two oh, points. Oh, no. So you had a chance then? We lost by two points. But can you imagine being, being nowhere and nothing, secretary, four months later, if we'd have won, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready mentally. I, I hadn't done my, I hadn't earned my stripes in the music industry, you know. So I feel like when we did it in 78, I'd, I knew enough by then. I'd had I, enough gigs under my belt and, yeah. you know, we did a few tellies. We had a top 20 hit with the song, which was, um, what was it called? I'm not, do you know what? It's not my, box Fizz is my thing. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Coco, I, and the reason yeah. I'm asking you is because I can't remember, I can't remember myself. Remember. Hang on, let me think about it. That was the only chart hit, wasn't it, as well? Yeah, it yeah. was the bad old days. It was called the bad old days. But when you go back to that first time in Eurovision, do you have fond memories? Because I've seen interviews with you where you actually spoke about it in not the most positive way. You kind of said it wasn't your... Nothing. was. Yeah. I don't remember anything being good. I hated it. Why? What was it about that situation? Well, we lost and we lost. We came 11th, which was the worst the UK had ever done. So I felt like I'd let Queen Elizabeth down. And uh, and the whole thing, was we were kind of not liked because we were British and we'd been um, tipped to win. And I'd, I felt there was a lot of jealousy. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I didn't like the whole thing. And I'd never stayed in a posh hotel before and I didn't know stuff. I didn't know what you, I didn't know how to conduct myself. I didn't, I wasn't, I really wasn't happy. I really wasn't happy. The only good thing to come out of that was my brother Colin came over um, and he was like my ally, if you like. I, I could yeah. see Colin and, but everything about that, that Eurovision brings back bad memories. So I didn't realise you, so you were tipped to win that. So there's kind of like a pressure on you as a group yeah. to go out there and deliver the kind of um, people thinking you're going to win. So yeah. that's probably made it even tougher that you're predicted to win and then you get that result. Like you said, it was the, the worst ever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 11th now we'd, we'd think was we'd a success. We'd, we'd, be, yeah. uh, we'd be celebrating <laughs> that. Um, so let's go from that then to Bucks Fizz. Yeah. So how did that happen? Were you put together especially for Eurovision? Yes. So, Coco used to use a recording studio called Mayfair Sound and someone else who used that studio was a lady called Nicola Martin and whenever Mayfair Sound had an event, they would always invite Coco and they would always invite Nicola Martin. So I got to know her. I didn't particularly like her. I was a bit scared of her because she's very much a man's woman okay. and she's very powerful um, and she scared me. So, um, but... But for some reason she liked me. I don't know why. And uh, and so I left Coco in the summer of 1980. I'd had enough. Um, and I went to work for Mayfair Sound, the studio. Wow. I did their, I typed their letters because that's what I trained for. I did their invoices. And I was there to do backing vocals if anyone needed it. And one day in walked Nicola Martin. And she said, Tara, why are you here? And I said, I've left Coco. So she obviously logged this. This would have been probably maybe September, October time. And just before Christmas of 1980, I had a phone call to say that she'd, um, she wanted me to be in this band called Bucks Fizz. So after, wow. To be honest, the first time she rang, she spoke to my mum, I was out. And when I got home, she went, my mum said, Ray, you know my mum's name's Rita. Ray, um, Lady rang you, Nicola Martin. I went, what's she want? And she went, oh, she didn't say. I went, oh, well, she'll have to ring again then, won't she? Because <laughs> <laughs> she scared wow. me. So uh, I waited and she rang, she rang again. I still wasn't in, but the next time there was a phone call was from her partner, Andy Hill, 
who wrote Making Your Mind Up, and I answered the phone, thankfully. And he said, I've written this song, Nicola says you're perfect for the band, do you want to be in it? And I went, yeah, all right then. That's inc- so it's kind of a flashback from when you said you were originally a secretary, then you got Coco, uh, no, you r- went to do the song for Europe in 76, and then the same situation in 1980, you were a secretary, yeah. and then you get that opportunity. Yeah, that's I've never put of- those two together, but that's right. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. When I left Coco, I thought I'll just go back to having a proper wow. job. Yeah. So wasn't to be though. What was it like when you met your other band members for the first time? Did you oh. click straight away or were you unsure about some well, of them? I, okay, so it was the 7th of January. I knocked on the door of Nicola's house in Fulham. She opened the door and there was a there was a, a staircase right in front of me and coming down the stairs was this beautiful bloke. He'd just got out of the bath. And he had a white towel, towel draped around his, just hanging on his hips. And I, oh, I thought, he's beautiful. It was Mike Nolan. Wow. And Mike and I just clicked from the very moment that we ever first met. It was, it was fantastic. Honestly, I felt like I'd, I felt like I had another brother. I've got two brothers now. I've got three with Mike. Um, but when I first met Mike and uh, Jay and Bobby. It was four days later. It was the 11th of January. She, Nicola had found uh, Bobby through the stage um, newspaper. He answered an advert and Jay came through a dance agency. Mike was already, he was already part of Bucks Fears because he did the demo. He did yeah. the vocals on the demo. He was a mate of Nicola's. So it was always going to be Mike first, then me, and then he, they, she found Jay and Bobby. We were introduced to each other on the 11th of January and straight away, you know, me and Mike were like that. Yeah. And I couldn't get, couldn't get to Bobby the and others. Jay. Couldn't get to them. You know, it's, I tried to strike up a conversation. It was really hard. But, you see, Jay was only 19. You know, she was wow, a baby. Really I was young. 27. She was a bub. And Bobby was the same age as me, but he's a tea drinking man's man and women make the tea so that didn't go down very well with me so uh, and yet I think as well Nicola said you have to listen to Cheryl because Cheryl's done the Eurovision before she's done the song for Europe and I did three or four yeah. songs for Europe and so she said um listen to Cheryl because she's got the she's got the uh, knowledge and and I don't think that went down at all well with Bobby so so we uh, we clashed Bobby and I What's incredible, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on, because you you look at you and Jay now, and it's like sisters, you know? I, I see you in interviews, and you have such a close connection, but back then, it, it wasn't instant. Honestly, it was really hard. But I don't think it's just... I mean, we come from completely different, you know, lives. Uh, uh, my livelihood was... Not my livelihood, my life was just an ordinary life, living with your mum and dad and your brothers and sister in Bethnal Green in a council flat and going over the park and getting having a proper job. Jay's life was her mum and dad were showbiz. Her brother yeah. was in showbiz. I mean, her life was complete. She was on tour all the time and she was a dancer from the age of 14, like a professional dancer. So her life was completely different from mine and we had nothing in common. And... Honestly, now I would say that um, we're still not like that. Not like Mike and I. Never. Not like Mike and I. I think she's still quite envious of the relationship that I have with Mike. But we get on great now, and I and I admire her. She's, there's a lot of things that I think she's amazing at. You know, with a clothes style, and mm. she's got a really artistic eye. Um, and I think likewise, she admires me because harmonies and stuff like that. You know, I can sort out what everyone has to sing in. You know, we've um, we've got a mutual admiration. But, again, probably we're never going to be best mates, but we work really well together. Well, let's go back to when you won Song for Europe for, of course, Bucks Fizz. Yeah. Did that feel for you like a second chance because you had such a bad experience representing the UK previously? Did this feel like, this is my chance now, I can, I can do this? No, not at all. I just thought, mum and dad can video us. We'd, oh, great, we've won. We won easily. And did you know that my husband, Steve, was in that song for Europe? No. See, I'm coming out with all these what? revelations. Jane, are you him. hearing this? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, yeah, he was. Is... And I knew Steve from 1975 
Um, and, you know, when we saw each other in 1978, I went, Stradley, because everyone calls him Stradley. Yeah. Stradley, and he was Cheryl. Yeah, and he was, he was in that song for Europe. So I, all the, the reason that I did it was not to win the Eurovision because I'd lost before. I knew it's not easy to win the Eurovision Song Contest. So I thought, we're going to lose again. I'm just going to do this. I mean, mum and dad can have it on video and then I can go back to being a secretary. That was in my head. I didn't think, wow. oh, good, my second chance. Well, let's go back to that night. So you're now representing the UK for Eurovision, making your mind up. What's it like when you walk out on that stage and you're about to perform? Can you actually remember anything from that night? Yeah, everything. Really? Everything, yeah. It was, um, it was absolutely terrifying. And I, I thought, I'm not going to remember the routine. I'm not going to be able to sing. I'm going to forget the words. And you do, you have this panic. But we were so well rehearsed. I mean, that was another Nicola thing. Just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Yeah. And if you think you've rehearsed enough, it's time to rehearse again, you know. And uh, and so you go, you kind of go on automatic pilot, and the song is over like that. It's so quick. Yeah. I mean, it's less than three minutes anyway, but that three minutes just flies by. And when you first hear the drums, da, 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 yeah. da, 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 and you have to start wiggling your bum and everything, <laughs> and then in no time at all, you're making your mind up, da, 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 and it's done. Yeah. And you think, oh, you know, it, it was. You just hope that you've done your best. You know that you've done your best. You know that you've. I mean, because I've been watching the Olympics and I love watching international sport and everyone, when they're doing something to represent their country or, you know, to be the best in their field, you know that you try, you pull it out of the bag. Yeah. And, and that's what happened. We pulled it out of the bag. I mean, most with Eurovision, the song's important, you know, having that good song, but the routine is equally as important. Mm. And that dance, a lot of people replicate at parties, but who came up with the famous skirt rip? Because that just got such a reaction. And when you mentioned Bucks Fizz, everyone automatically skirt ripped. So whose masterpiece was that? Apparently they ran out of Velcro the next day. Um, <laughs> apparently they did. I don't know. Someone told me that. Um, it was it was actually the person who, who came up with the idea was Chrissy Wickham, who's the choreographer. But we were having this meeting about the clothes. We knew that Nicola wanted bright colours, so it was always going to be yellow, green, blue, red. Um, she wanted us all to be the same height as Mike. So Mike's five foot seven. So Jay and I, with our heels on, are five foot seven. She wanted it to be, she knew exactly yeah. what she wanted, except for the clothes, wasn't sure about the style of clothes. And I, I've always, I've been a runner. I, I used to love, I wanted to be an Olympic runner, actually. I wanted to win an Olympic gold medal when I was young. And so I'm, fairly muscly, especially my thighs, they're really chunky. And so I wanted a knee-length skirt. And I said the, the song lends itself to being a bit of a rockabilly type yeah. song. We can do a bit of rock and roll, which we did in the middle of the song. We broke into a little rock and roll dance. Um, Jay sensibly said mini skirts because it will attract more attention. But I was thinking, oh, hang on, they're going to see my muscly legs. Um, so we were having this discussion and everyone was there, the record label, the production company, um, the, the writers, the choreographer and, the, and us, our manager, everybody was there. And then we're all given a different opinion. And I went, oh, for goodness sake, let's just have both. And I was fed up with the discussion. And Chrissy Wickham, the choreographer, went, that's it. On the line, if you want to see some more, we take the top skirt off and the mini skirts wow. underneath. That's how it happened. It won us the Eurovision Song Contest. We wouldn't have won without Velcro. We wouldn't have. We wouldn't have. It's so incredible, though, because you look back now, and it, I mean, I know you still on some shows do that, you know? Um, All you, shows. Yeah. Every show. Is this, but the reaction, does it get the big reaction every single time? Every time. Yeah. It always gets a cheer. And oh. you see the cameras come out ready to, to take the photo of the, yeah. the moment when the skirts come so off. The anticipation. Yeah. You know, when you're sat there, so you finish your performance and you're sat waiting for the results, you know, every country's given their score. What's that like? Because I, I would be biting my nails. I'd be so nervous, when, especially when you see how close it's yeah. becoming. So what was that like for you? And what were your memories of waiting for that? And it was result? really close. It was Very. really close. And we were we kept doing this. There were five countries that kept kind of overtaking yeah. and going up. It was Thrilling and exciting, but absolutely blimmin' terrifying. And there's photos where you can see us going, 
You can <laughs> see it. There's, uh, people took photos, thankfully, and I've seen them since then. And you can, I think you can buy them on, you know, on whatever you buy them on. There's, you can see us, yeah. the, the nerves. And, but um, it was, it was um, terrifying, terrifying. Well, that win changed your life. I mean, it yeah. really changed your life Absolutely. because the song straight to number one yeah. in the charts. And, you know, I've spoke to many guests uh, doing these shows. And, you know, back in the 80s, to get to number one is completely different. You had to sell a lot of records. People yeah. had to go out, physically buy it. So to go to number one, how did you feel? Because that must have been like, what's going on? I've just won Eurovision. I'm now number one in yeah. the UK charts. What went through your mind? It was astonishing. It was absolutely wonderful. And then to hear that you're number one in Germany, you're number here, number one in Australia, you're number one in France. All these nine countries, I think it went to number one. It wow. was it was it was my dream come true, as you know, my childhood dream since winning since watching Sandy Shaw win. Yeah. And thinking, wow, that's like winning an Olympic gold medal, but for music, you know. And uh and that's exactly what it was. And the moment that you realised it, that we realised it, was straight after the the competition, after the after yeah. you know the music had played. We were on stage. We had our flowers, and it was all tearful. And then you have to do the photo session, and we were on like this. We were on a, a, a platform, round platform, and we were surrounded everywhere by photographers, cameramen, and and that's when that was when it, I realised because. All, all um, countries, you know, if, it was, we were completely surrounded by people who wanted to take photos of us. And I thought, oh, my life's just changed. And it carried on. The yeah. photographers, the attention, the being in the front page of the magazines, the yeah. papers. Um, my favourite Bucks Fizz song is The Land of Make Believe. I just love it. I love the dance routine because you're actually in the bed. In the beginning of the video, aren't you? And then you run through, and then you, you go onto the yeah, stage. Yeah, it's weird. I'm in I'm in bed, but I've got a Mac on. <laughs> What's all that about? <laughs> um, but again, that got you another number one single. Yeah. So you know, you've got the success of making your mind up, and then bang, another yeah. number one. You know, did that feel surreal in a sense of okay, this is continuing now. It's not just a little phase with Eurovision and the song. We're actually continuing this momentum. Well, the second single was called Piece of the Action. It went to number 12 and it went silver, which meant it sold more yeah. than 250,000. 250, and then the third single was um, one of those nights, went to 20. So I thought, ah, here we go. It's the downward spiral, you know. And then Land of Make Believe. And that was within one. 12 months as well, all three yeah. of them. It's yeah. incredible. So to go back to number one was fantastic, especially because it was around Christmas time. So unfortunately, we didn't quite get the Christmas number one. We were, um, it was Don't You Want Me was the Christmas number one. And then we knocked it off in the new year. But um, that would have been great to have been the yeah. Christmas number one. But the beauty of being a, a big hit like that, we were a very, we were a very visual act because we did all the dance routines. So we had loads and loads of TVs and we had our own strip cartoon in Look In magazine. And, and, um, and then the following Christmas, by then we'd had another number one, uh, we were asked to do um, the Christmas Top of the Pops, which was second only to win in Eurovision. Yeah. To be on the Christmas Top of the Pops was really up there, you know. And, and, and the BBC pulled all the stops out they gave us, the, they made us these amazing costumes. They they asked us, each of us, what we wanted to be, and I wanted to be a fairy. And um, and so they made this, this beautiful fairy costume and they put me on wires. And so in the middle of the dance routine, Run for the Sun, I flew. <laughs> that was great. It was great. I loved it. You mentioned that another number one, you know, and of course, my camera never lies. Yeah. Um, I, Again, three UK number ones within 12 months. Yeah. It was starting to beat records and you guys were being spoke about in a completely different way. Yeah. But that song, a lot of people, when you speak to them, it's the two, you know, Land of Make Believe and uh, Making Your Mind Up that they know. My Camera Never Lies, a lot of people know, but it's not as well known as the other two. It's one of those songs that when you hear it, you go, oh, that's that was, right. Yeah. 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 In fact, a lot, of our, a lot of our singles are like that. We don't get played enough on the radio. Well, I, I've actually, we were trying to do a little dance routine earlier. So if you saw us before you came. Um, what I wanted to talk to 
uh, to you about is obviously after that, and you had the chart success towards the mid eighties, the chart success slightly started to decline. You know, you've gone from the three UK number ones and there was a decline. Why do you think that was? Because in the 80s, it seemed that everything changed so quick. Yeah. Was it because you were kind of the good people of pop, very cleaned image, and then it got a little bit more different with the image with some of the acts in the mid-80s? I think that the, um, they were trying to um, change us with the change in the music industry because, so, you know, we did we went through the whole um, new romantic look yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and, yeah, the, the singles, I mean, we had seven top ten singles and then another three top 20, but then we started to peak at, in the 30s and everything. So, And some of our songs, some of those songs, like Heart of Stone, I think was possibly even 50-something, I can't remember, 40 or 50, but it's, in my opinion, it's one of the best songs we ever did. But also you have to remember that a lot of the people who bought our singles in the early 80s were the eight to 12 age group and they'd grown older and they'd grown more into the Durands and the Spandaus and, you know, it's what happens. It's a natural thing. So, um, so it was unfortunate, but I mean, actually, you know, we had our last top 10 was new beginning, which was in 1986. So five years of being, of having top 10 hits was pretty, pretty good. I mean, a lot of bands now would love that, would love five years. You know, sometimes now you're in, with one single, and then you forgot exactly. So, there were reports at the time towards the mid '80s that there were tensions within the band. Um, you know, I was reading various reports, whether it was who did do the lead single, routines, costumes. Were there any truth in that, or is it just kind of gossip? W- no, there was tensions in the group from day one. Really, from the first day we met. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was and it? And it was who mainly. I mean, uh, well, I don't know. Possibly. But uh, it wasn't from me because I'm very happy singing harmony. I'm very yeah. happy being, you know, there was one album when I don't have one single lead and yet it's my favourite Bucksby's album and that was Are You Ready? That's my favourite album and I don't sing lead on any of them. But I know that my voice is the sound of most of those songs. So yeah. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I don't, it does, I don't care if no one else knows it, but I know it. Um, but I think possibly there might have been tension between Bobby and Jay and maybe Mike, maybe yeah. Mike. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. It's so crazy to hear because you, you see you on TV and you seem so close knit together. So to hear that there were actual, you know, tensions, you kind of think, really? You just, you seem to be this happy group of four people that loving, infectious and <laughs> yeah. We did work well together. <laughs> you don't have to like the people you work with. Um, as long as it works, as long as you've got a good working relationship, yeah. that's all you need. I mean, we would come off stage and go our separate ways, hmm. except for me and Mike. We would do everything together. But, um, but you know, we we didn't um, socialise together or anything like that. But on stage, we were a good format. It really worked. Well, I want to go back to, and I know this would be difficult to talk about, you know, 1984 when tragedy uh, struck with the, it was your tour bus crashed into a lorry. Yeah. And that changed not all of your lives, but the band as well. I mean, you had some horrific injuries. I mean, was it broken ribs? No, what it was, um, it was vertebrae in my spine. So, wow. um, right. So what actually happened, we just finished, it was the second night of a tour and the coach was practically brand new. It was about two weeks old and we were in Newcastle and um, we did the gig at the Newcastle City Hall. Fantastic gig, amazing audience. And I was at that time, I was presenting a television show called How Dare You. Um, It was the first show I'd ever presented. And all of the crew and the other presenters came to see that show and we saw them afterwards, came into our dressing room, the producer of how dare you? And the, I'll tell you who was in it. Carrie Grant, you know the um, yes. the singing teacher now. She was she did the Fame other. Academy with yeah. Well, she yeah. she was how dare she did how dare wow. you with me. Anyway, um, and so we were on a high. We were going to be doing how dare you the Christmas special the next day as a band, and I would be presenting it as well. And it was great. It was a really happy time in our lives and our career. And we boarded the coach after the gig to go to the Gosforth Park Hotel, which was 
between 10 and 15 minutes away, that's all. But we had to go on the A1. A and the A1 coming towards Newcastle um, had roadworks. And so the traffic had to be diverted onto our side of the road. So, in other words, it was two-way traffic, where normally it was a dual carriageway. And um, meantime, Mike had gone up to the front of the coach to get a box of Ferrero Rocher that had been thrown on stage for him. And they weren't there. And so he blamed the driver, Pete Black. Pete went, Cheryl, Cheryl, come down here. That bloody Nolan, he's, uh, he blames me. He says, I've eaten his Ferrero Rocher. So I walked to the front of the coach. And that's the last thing I know. The, the next, I woke up in the road and it was really weird because I don't remember a thing about it, neither does Mike. We both went through the windscreen. And, um, and I woke up and there were blue flashing lights and there were blokes looking at me and it was the most bizarre feeling, you know. And the realisation, because obviously you hit your head. If you're going to go through a windscreen, you're going to hit your head. I don't know how hard I hit the ground. Um, but the first thing I did was move my legs to make sure that I could. Um, and, and Mike... Actually, at that time, because I broke vertebrae in my back and I also had a slit with mini skirt on and a little pair of boots and I just took all the skin off of this leg and off my back. And so when I went to hospital, I had to put a cradle over me so that nothing touched me. Um, and Mike was not so bad, not so bad. He, he, was, he could walk, which I couldn't. And the next morning he came in to see me. And, uh, and we both looked a terrible mess. I mean, you don't go through a windscreen and come out of it looking lovely. You know, I was, my sister said I looked like Quasimodo. I was, I was bruised all over, black eyes. I put my front tooth through my bottom lip. Um, my hair looked like I'd backcombed it with blood and glass, as did Mike. Mike looked the same. And I went, oh, Mike, if your fans could see you now, and he went, oh, don't make me laugh. He said, I've got a terrible headache. And then he slipped into a coma shortly after that and had to have a blood clot removed from his brain, which changed him completely. I mean, we, we couldn't work then, obviously, for months and months. And to be perfectly honest as well, Jay wasn't happy at that time. She hadn't been happy for a while. And it was, for her, it was time to leave. So we did, I think, one more gig with Jay. It was three or four nights at a, at a nightclub that we were booked to do, months after the coach crash, you know. But that was her time to leave, so she she left shortly after. But the thing, you know, going back to to Mike, you know, it was so touch and go. You know, yeah. it. I saw the press reports, and there are rumours that during was it one of the operations that he actually died and then came back to life. Um, you just said about, about you and Mike, almost like a brother, another brother to you. What was going through your mind at that time? Because I guess you were only given selected information. You didn't know too much about what was going on. Well, I was away with the fairies. So um, I, I didn't, I kept slipping in and out of consciousness myself. And when I was feeling better, I still wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and the registrar, I called him Ralph the Reg came in to see me and he said, you might have heard all the kerfuffle last night. And I went, no. And he said, well, your friend Mike has been taken to another hospital. He had, he had to have emergency surgery. He said, it's not looking great. And I went, he's going to be fine. But the reason I said that was because I was like in cuckoo land. And, um, and it was only a few days later I saw the front cover of a newspaper and Mike's picture was there and saying, Mike Nolan, fighting for his life. And it was the realisation of seeing it in print and seeing his picture um, made me realise that he could have died and it was cl he was close to it. And as you say, I think, I think they brought him around two or three times, actually. They, yeah. So he could have, we could have lost him. And, you know, you can see how much he means to you because you can, you know, visibly see the emotion on your face when you talk about Mike. So to actually realise how close you are is actually really nice. You know? I do a show on ships and I, and I talk about my life in Bucks Fears and, and I show some of the footage, the TV footage of the coach crash and I show a picture of the coach. 
you can't believe anyone got out of it alive. You absolutely, honestly, to look at it, you, it always draws a sharp intake of breath from the audience because you look at it and think, how did anybody get out of that, let alone everybody alive? Um, and then a, a, a picture of Mike comes up and I can't talk about it without crying. When I see that footage, it just brings that back to me, you know. But I'll never remember, I don't think ever, what actually happened. I think it's your brain's way of saying, this is really unpleasant and you don't want to remember this bit. Mike doesn't remember it either. We just remember waking up in the road. Well, so with Mike, you know, because when he came out of the coma and he started to talk again and what, can you remember your first conversation with Mike? After yeah, that? distinctly. It was extraordinary. He, uh, cause I went to see him straight away as soon as I, as soon as I could. Um, I was released from hospital a fortnight after the accident and, uh, and it was Christmas time. I was released on Christmas Eve, I think it was. And I went back up to Newcastle on Boxing Day. I had to go and see him. Um, then he wasn't, I couldn't have spoken to him then. It was a time after. I kept every two or three days I went up to see him. And um, a particular time when he, he could speak, I opened the door and he, you could see in his eyes he recognised me. And I said, um, Mike, do you remember me? And he went, yeah. And I said, what's my name then? And he said, I can't say it, but I can spell it. And I went, all right, then spell it. And he went, B-I-R-D-Y. Birdie? Yeah. Was that what he called you? No. Oh. <laughs> so I've absolutely no idea why wow. he called me that. But then that day I sat with him and he had... Um, um, one of the the people who come in and do rehabilitation and everything, and they were showing him cards, you know, what is this, yeah. you know, and ladder, sausage, all, all these things that they were showing him to try and get his mind, his brain kind of working again. Um, it, was a, it was tough for Mike and it took him, I won't say it took him months or years, I would say it took him decades, really, to get over it. And there's certain things like he has tunnel vision, so he can't drive. So if if um, he can't see this side of him at all, he can see some of this side. But I stand to his right on stage, so he can't see me in the slight. He has to move like that to see me. Um, he really, the big thing for him is because of his eyesight, he had his license taken away so he can't drive. So he lost his independence. But also he has to take drugs for epilepsy. He hasn't had a fit for years, but he can't yeah. risk it. You know, he can't risk it. So, but he's still great. He's still great. Having said that, he wants to leave Bucks Fizz so, or the Fizz. We're gonna we're gonna go into that later because that's um kind of big news at the moment. But yeah. how long was it? Because when Jay left, you had Shelley um, mm -hmm. join the band. What was your relationship like with with Shelley? Initially, it was fantastic. She was lovely, and she did um, amateur operatics like with yeah. me, or not. I, I used to do ones like La Vie Parisienne and, and um, Deflader Mouse. She did more like Oklahoma and Paint Your Wagon, that kind of thing. So, But I did those as well. And we used to sing songs from the shows. And I, I thought she was the mate that I never had with Jay. Yeah. You know, she was, the, she was the buddy sort of thing. Um, um, so initially, yeah, we had a great relationship. In fact, I would say we, we did have a really good relationship. She, she lived with me um, when I lived in South East London, she lived with me for a year and then scroll forward to the early 2000s, she lived with me again for another year, you know, she's uh, when we got back together. Um, but I don't know, I'm not going to say anything bad about her, but um, things just changed. That's all I'm going to say. Well, that's, you know, I just want to quickly go back to obviously after the accident because you set up a charity yeah. Or, um, head first. Yeah. Um, are you it still called, part of that? No, it's no. finished. But it was initially it was called the Mike Nolan Brain Damage Research and Equipment Fund. But in those days, you we didn't pay by cards. We paid by checks. And you can't fit that on a check. <laughs> <laughs> so we changed it. to make it. it smaller. We changed it to head first. But, yeah, I was a trustee and a trustee wow. of a charity. You go to all the meetings and, you know, it's not like supporting it's being a t an integral yeah. part of the charity. But, we, yeah, we raised hundreds of thousands of pounds and we did some amazing work into research into brain damage. 
Um, but it it just it ran its course. It was based at um, I think it was King's College Hospital, and so we just handed all our stuff over, and and they they carried on. So I do other stuff now. Yeah. What made you leave the band? Because you know you you've loved this. You've you've had Shelley in the band. Mike's now back. So what made you say now's the time? Shelley left on New Year's Eve, nineteen eighty nine. So she was with the band at that time. It was longer than Jay, funny enough. But we only had one hit single with her, which was New Beginning. I got to number eight in 1986. And um, so by the time Shelley left, uh, we were touring in Australia and the Far East and that and doing good gigs and everything. But after that, especially in the early 90s, I stayed because of Mike. I, I just, he was the only reason I stayed. At that time, uh, I mentioned that I did How Dare You was my first yeah. presenting job. By the time the late 80s came around, I was doing telly all the time. I was doing um, uh, record breakers and then lots of other shows. And I was always being asked to be a guest on different shows. I just, I think I was flavour of the month for a while. And, um, and I left in 93 and it was December the 11th which funnily enough is the same day as we had the coach crash December the 11th um but I was doing more television than anything and I got pregnant and I thought I can't be on the road and and have babies at home I can't do that so it was the perfect time to leave and I remember the last gig I was we were working at a a a club called GAY in London and in those days, that was at the Astoria uh, Theatre, which was, which had a hollow stage. And so we were on stage. It was really a, in, the, in the morning. It was about one or two in the morning or something. And it was full of smoke because in those days you could smoke. So thick with smoke, really loud. And because of the hollow stage, the bass was resonating through my body. And I thought, what am I doing to my unborn babies? And I couldn't wait to get off the stage and go home and think that's it, that's enough. And just do TV. Even on my passport, um, you used to have to write your profession. And I wrote TV presenter. I wasn't singing anymore. And when that, like you said, your career was huge with presenting. I yeah. mean, you, you went on uh, Record Breakers and that was for a long time, you know. 11 uh, series. Which is incredible. Um, I know we were talking to Shane before we did this and he, you know, he said, what was Roy Castle like to work mm. with? You know, what was your relationship like with Roy? What was he like as a person? He was absolutely wonderful. Um, he's the bloke you want next door. He was your favourite uncle, you know. Yeah. He was the person you could confide in. In fact, when I got pregnant, because I had to go through IVF to get pregnant, um, after my husband, he was the first person I told. He was, I, I loved him. I loved him. He was just a wonderful man and his lovely wife as well. They were he was such a lovely man and he always had time for you. He was never number one. You know, he always put you first in conversation and everything. He was great. Thrilled and honoured that I worked with him. What was your favourite memory when you think back to your time on Record Breakers? What stands out as that was, that was the one oh, for Oh, wow, me? that's a hard question. I know <laughs> over that many series there's going to be a lot, but was there one that so you many. just... Well, I suppose the records that we broke... Um, and I remember in particular a couple that we broke. Um, one was the longest rope slide, which was from the top of Blackpool Tower. And Roy was terrified of heights. And we had to, the night before, we had to go to the top and, uh, and stand on this tiny little platform. And he was shaking. He couldn't oh. speak. And I really remember that. And the way that he combated his fears was by to actually do what he was afraid of and um and I thought oh he's not gonna he's not gonna manage to do this rope slide he won't do it and and he was going oh he was shaking and his voice was quivery and everything and I thought what are we gonna do and I spoke to the producer what are we gonna do if Roy does and he went well you'll have to do it on your own Cheryl I went oh okay it's fine it's fine next day it was like he was a different person I, he didn't sleep the night before, you know, he was so nervous. And uh, he put the harness on the next morning and he went down that rope down to the promenade in Blackpool 
And bearing in mind this was a world record, this was yeah. the longest what anyone had ever done, he went down it singing, oh, I do like to be beside the seaside. <laughs> and I went down going... <laughs> <laughs> so he combated his nerves pretty yeah. quick. And, and likewise, another one, another record, was wing walking. I tried it, but went up for 15 minutes standing on top of a, of a plane thinking, what the hell am I doing? I don't like being in a plane and I'm standing on top of it. He did it. He did wow. it and he'd won, he did the world record for the longest. And yet this man is afraid of heights. Incredible. He was, he was incredible. Uh, before we came in earlier, we were talking about, obviously you hosted your own show at Eggs and Baker yeah. um, for three series, which was like music. Five series. Five series. And it was cooking and music. Music, yeah. It was my two loves. Who came up with, with that? Was it put to you or did you come up with it? No, well, I did a show called um, The Saturday Picture Show in 1985, I think, with Mark Curry, live Saturday morning programme, which the Saturday morning programmes were huge back yeah. in the 80s, weren't they? And um, and I and we sometimes, we'd, I, I remember once making a train out of biscuits and icing and I and I put the icing on and I stuck all the biscuits together and I went, and there it is. Woo woo choo 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 choo. And I went like this and moved the train along and it all fell apart. And so did I fall apart laughing. And so they thought, right, we're gonna do some more of this. And then they gave me a um the following year, they gave me my own little 15 minute thing called called Cheryl's Out to Lunch. So that was a cookery thing. And then they they liked the fact that it it seemed to be quite popular. So they gave me Eggs and Baker. Eggs and Baker, the name, came from um, Ed Pugh, who was the head of children's in those days. And as I said, for five years on a Saturday morning, sometime in one year, I think it was an hour long, and we would go, this was children's telly, Saturday morning. We would go on trips abroad. We would go to, you know, we, do, we did a trip a, a, around America, across America. We were over there for about 10 days filming going to beautiful places in Europe and, ah, oh, it was fantastic. I loved it. And having new bands, Blur, Blur, wow, the first, yeah. the first, their first television um, performance was on Eggs and Baker. It was That's great. Huge. I loved it. You look at their legacy now as I well. Know. Um, this confuses me and I've got to ask you about it because obviously now you're touring as The Fizz. Yeah. And I don't understand because... You know, up until recently with Mike's decision to leave, you've got three original members <coughs> as the Fizz, or you've got one member with Bobby G, with three people that weren't ever in Bucks Fizz, yeah. can <coughs> legally call themselves Bucks Fizz. Yeah. What happened there, and why can't you tour as the name that you've always toured it as? It's bizarre. Bobby's wife registered the trademark. So it actually, the name Bucks Fizz doesn't even belong to Bobby. He belongs to his wife, who at the time was called Heidi Manton. And Heidi was nine, I think, when we won the Eurovision. But wow. she can call herself Bucks Fizz and we can't. Uh, it's the law. It's the law. We opposed it at the trade. We had a trademark sort of meeting, hearing. And the guy from the trademarks, he didn't know Bucks Fizz from Adam. He didn't, he wasn't interested in music. He was only interested in trademarks. And he said, well, this band have been, oh, pardon me, this is noisy water. <laughs> this band have been um, trading as Bucks Fizz, so I don't see any reason why it should be otherwise. And so he let, he let Heidi have the name. Did she never once step back and think, do you know what, this is stupid. They, they've won Eurovision. They've got this huge legacy. This name doesn't, but did, was there never that offer from Heidi to give it to you? You would have to ask Heidi. That's bizarre. She lives in Tiverton. Come ask her. <laughs> do you ever, so with Bobby, because obviously it is you free, do you ever speak to Bobby? Never. Not at all. What's your rela relationship? What was it like with him? Or is it I wouldn't quite... cross the road if I, if I saw him. If I saw him, I would give him a hug. I mean, we have history. Yeah. We have fantastic history. We've been all over the world together, you know? Um, so I would give him a hug and I would hug her. You know, I, I think that they were being careful about the name that they owned. But I do think it's, you know, legally it's right, morally it's wrong. Yeah. Because, you know, you can't take it away from us. We won the Eurovision. Heidi Manton yeah. didn't. We won. We exactly. were Bucks Fizz. 
And I think it's wrong morally that we can't use it. It should be Cheryl Mike and Jay Bucks Fizz, Bobby G Bucks Fizz. Yeah. Um, but it isn't. And so we have to live with that. Do you think you will ever work together, the f- four of you again, ever perform? We've approached Bobby several times and uh, not me personally, but through Mike usually or Jay, but never me. I mean, I, I honestly, like I say, I would not cross the road yeah. if I saw him. I would, I would welcome him with open arms, but we, we never did really get on. And so I can't see any reason why that would change, but I would certainly work with him. I don't think he would, well, I know he wouldn't work with us. That's such a shame. Like you said, you've got all this history, a one-off show, because I know there was an offer put to you. Um, yes, there's been, I mean, apparently we were offered a million pounds. Was that true? Because I read that and I was like, wow. I read it too. If so I was I Bobby G, I'd be ringing you up and like, get me on that stage. <laughs> <laughs> there's a million pounds. Yeah, I know. I, I, it, apparently it was true, but I don't know. Wow. I don't know. Um, another thing that this confuses me. So David Van Day was with... <gasps> <laughs> I'm sorry to do this, but I mean, he was in Dollar, so an 80s duo, um, and he did his thing with them. He then briefly, mid-90s, worked with Mike as Bucks Fizz. He worked with Bobby first. Bobby, and then, and then he left Bobby then, after yeah. a dispute and then went to Mike. Yes. But he then, after not working with any of them, went on, on and toured under Bucks Fizz. So then you've got four non-original members yeah. of a band touring as Bucks Fizz. How was that even allowed? Yeah. I mean, that went for a big dispute, didn't it, legally? Yes, it did. And I think, unfortunately, I think that's why Bobby wanted to protect the name Bucks right. Fizz and, and Mike at that time, because what, what happened with... Uh, so Bobby asked David Van Day to replace Mike because at the time... A lot of people thought that Mike and David looked very similar, so it, yeah. it seemed a the good idea. That, yeah, yeah. Um, but he didn't get on at all well with Bobby, and so he left. I don't know if he was asked to leave. I've no idea. And because he knew all the songs, he rang Mike and said, "Look, I know all the songs. Let's go out as me and you and get another couple of girls," which they did. But he used to hold the purse strings, David Van Day, and Mike. Unfortunately, it's never been great with money. Plus. After the coach crash, it was very easy to pull the wool over Mike's eyes. Not so much now, but certainly then. Even though it was a good few years later, he still wasn't quite right. And he trusted David, but David was untrustworthy. And eventually Mike discovered through his accountant or somebody that he should have had a lot more money than he had. And they looked into it and they asked to see the books and realised that they had been cooked by David Van Day. So Mike took him to court and Michael won. But David Van Day made himself bankrupt so he didn't have to pay a penny back. Then Mike had to pay all the court costs. Mike lost his home because of it. Um, and so that's why I hate David Van Day with a vengeance. I really do. I know it's a strong word. No, but what he did was unforgivable. Um, and so... I think that's why David, uh, Mike, when Bobby said he wanted to, he yeah, wanted to start Bucks Fizz, you know, and keep the name. Mike said, "You have it. I don't want David Van Day anywhere near it. It's not right, you know. You have it." And and um, unfortunately, that that's the way it was. Have you ever been in a situation with what you do and go into various events that you've been in the same room with David? Yes. How did that go? Twice. Did you say anything or was it the look? I had coffee, hot coffee in my hand (laughs) and my initial response when I saw his face was to throw it over him. Thankfully, I didn't. Honestly, it would have scalded him, but that was my initial reaction. I just kept out of his way and I said to the producer, don't let me anywhere near him and they didn't. They kept us apart. The next time was on Coach Trip. Do you remember that television program, Coach Trip? Yes, I remember. Yeah. I remember this. So... I didn't know who was going to be in that particular coach trip and I had to go down this slalom thing and then take my helmet off and then see the other um, celebrities that were there. And and I saw him in the middle and my heart sank and I I went to each and every one of those celebrities and gave him a big hug and I just skipped by him and went on to the next one. And it was so great because they had a picture of his face and he went... 
he put his arms out <laughs> to hug me. And there's no way I was even going to touch him with a barge pole. Um, and then we had to we had to vote people off, and they were all going. Oh, he was is partnered with Tony Blackburn, who's adorable. He's so nice, bless and him. Uh, and so they were saying, sorry, Tony and David, we're voting you off. Nothing personal, but it's because you didn't quite do this right, or you didn't. And then it got to me, and I went, everything personal. I can't bear you. And <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a look. Don't hold If you back. haven't seen it, have a look on YouTube. It's worth a look, honestly. Well, Cheryl, surprise. Uh, let's welcome. I'm honestly, joking. Honestly. <laughs> um, <laughs> y- y- we spoke earlier about the recent news that came out that Mike, who, um, like you said, is like a brother, is leaving yeah. the Fizz and you're now looking for two new members. Why Why is Mike leaving now? He's had enough. He's absolutely had enough and he's been moaning about it for the last three years. Actually, to be honest, it's since lockdown. Yeah. After lockdown... We had gigs that we were going to do, and he rang me and went, Shell, and his voice was really soft, as if he'd been troubling over it, you know, and he went, Shell, I don't think I want to work anymore. And I went, oh, Mike, I said, you you know, you're contracted. Oh, but Shell, I don't don't want to, I don't want to. Anyway, since then, you know, he enjoys the gigs. He loves being on stage. He loves the camaraderie. He hates the journey. And Mike lives way down in Broadstairs on the south coast. Southeast coast. So even to get to me takes him an hour and a half on the train. He can't drive, as I mentioned earlier. So he gets to me an hour and a half. I pick him up. And then we drive to the meeting point where we see our tour manager. And then we start the journey to wherever the gig is. Because sometimes Mike's travelling for like eight to ten hours, and especially if we're doing Skegness or Minehead. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's... It's too much for him. And then we get back to my house and it's too late for him to get the train home because it's, you know, the last train is at 11 or whatever. So he has to stay over. So it's he's just had enough. And I think he's really looking forward to his last gig. What about you, though? You're kind of losing the person you're really close to. Yeah, but I'm not, am I? He's yeah. still, he's, I'll still see him. Just... I'll talk to him all the time. I might see him more often than I do now. You know, I only see him for gigs at the moment. So... And you and Jay are staying tight. Yeah, 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 we're staying tight and we're getting two blokes to replace mm. Mike. Well, we've got a couple here. We can choose Matt, Ryan, me, Shane. This <laughs> will audition for you. Because um, Jay's had a really tough time, you know, health. She really has. She's uh, battled cancer and she's got so much strength, you know. You, and I've seen you all on Loose Women um, and... She had this strength when she was talking about, but you got very emotional, you know, when you were talking about that because I guess you've seen her be uh, go through so many highs and so many lows. It was it was uh, so. When it happened to Jay, we were in the studio recording with Mike Stock, and she we knew that she was having tests done on her tongue because she found these white marks on her tongue and she didn't know what they were. And her dentist said, "I don't like those." You know, we need to have those looked at. And so she had biopsies and everything. And on the day that we were recording, and she was she was in actually to sing a song um, on the album called, but I can't remember, it will come to me, but it's a beautiful song, um, really beautiful song that, anyway, shut up, Ray, I'm going on. Um, she had the phone call from the hospital saying, we're really sorry, Jay. The biopsy has proved that you have got cancer and you need to have an operation. And they took 40% of her tongue away and they replaced it with muscle from her leg. I mean, it's amazing what they can do. Absolutely amazing. And because we were there, we lived it. We were there when she was told the bad news and we went to see her. I've got photos of her, you know, on the day that we went to see her straight out of hospital. And she was, what she went through for me, was it was so close. She's a singer yeah. and she had half her tongue removed. And she's got, and your tongue goes all the way down here. I didn't know that. I thought it just started at the back of your throat. I didn't know that. It goes right the way down. So she's got this scar down her neck like this. And if she's talking, like she couldn't be doing what I'm doing with you now because her tongue swells and she has to stop. And then for several days after, she can't perform or have a decent conversation she has to wait for her tongue to go down and it's just the reality of what happened to her and we were with her and Mm. you know it was it does upset me 
And did you know as well that her daughter had meningitis? So it was a really tough few years. Honestly, yeah. her daughter, that got me more than, than, than Jay because, you know, having daughters myself, and they were, funny enough, nine years apart, but they were born on the same day, the 20th of June. Wow. And, um, and to see her daughter, I mean, that absolutely broke my heart. That was horrific. And seeing her daughter with these horrible welts all over her body and being told that it was 50-50 as whether she was going to live. I mean, it was, it was shocking, horrible. But you're together and you're still doing your thing. And you know, yeah. I love that. And I love seeing, you know, you're on TV a lot now. I mean, more than kind of before, I'm seeing you on all the morning shows talking about the fizz. I, I mean, me and Shane were excited about the new members because we've rehearsed <laughs> our routines and we're, <laughs> well, you're going to be getting a text from us very soon. Um, but I've got to talk to you because I'm a massive fan of EastEnders. And then last year... There you are, oh, in I EastEnders. Know. And I was like, wait, how did that happen? Oh, because that it was such a cool storyline. And I you're in the Albert it. and you're performing. So yes. when you got the call, were you like, yes, get me in there? Of course I was. Yeah. Of course I was. I love EastEnders. I mean, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I don't watch it anymore. I used to be hooked to it. But now, I mean, we don't watch telly at tea time. That's, that's generally about the time that we have our dinner and we have the radio on or the kids are watching you know, Netflix or something. So us kids, they're 30, but anyway, they still live with us. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we, I don't watch it anymore. I don't watch it. We, we kind of, me and Steve watch telly from nine o'clock onwards, really, if there's yeah. a drama or a film or something. But, um, but to be asked to be a part of a storyline on EastEnders, <gasps> it was phenomenal. And to go, I, honestly, I can't tell you how excited I was to walk into the square, yeah, Albert Square, and then to go into the Queen Vic. Oh, it was fantastic. And when I saw Gillian Telforth, I thought, oh, I love her. Happy Bill. <laughs> Honestly, it was, oh, it was great. I loved it. And if they asked me, I think I'd have to be me, because I come from yeah. East London. I think if Cheryl Baker moved to East London, well, why wouldn't you now? Because it's yeah. the place to be. When I left, it was the place to leave. Now it's the place to move to. I think that I should, they should... Find a place for me every now and again. Oh, oh, Cheryl's in town again, you know. You pop think, back in. Yeah, I'd love <laughs> that. Happy's car. Um, <laughs> you do a lot for charity as well. You know, you, you give a lot of time and you support a lot of charities. And I've seen that you're actually a vice president of a charity called um, it's Abigail's Footsteps. Yeah. How did you become involved with that charity? And, you know, what's, what's your connection there? Oh, well, they wrote to me. They wrote oh. to Cheryl Baker, Item. I lived in a place called Item in Kent and it got to me. I don't suppose there's many Cheryl Bakers in item. You know, it's only a village. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a small charity and it's, um, it's, it's not a happy charity to talk about. It's not the kind of charity where you've got a teddy bear with a, yeah. you know, it's not like, you know, children in need and stuff like that. Um, it's for parents of um, stillborn babies. But the reason that it touched the nerve was because we nearly lost one of ours. So I had twins. Two things happened. At 20 weeks, I had a bleed and Steve took me to hospital and I had to stay in. The, the ward they put me in was the expectant mother's ward. So there's me laying in a bed surrounded by the curtains, NHS hospital, obviously, and, um, and with the fear that I was losing my babies. And they put me in a ward with women who were about to give birth. And they were, when I... That the following morning, because I went in in the middle of the night, the following morning when they were all waking up, they were going, oh, do you think you're having a boy or a girl? And there's, and I'm laying there thinking, am I losing my bubs? Are they, are they you know, am I going to lose them? So there's things that they do that are so completely wrong, you know, in hospitals. You can't put a mother who's possibly losing her babies in with parents that are in with women who are just about to have theirs. It's just so wrong. Anyway, the other thing that happened was when I did give birth, thankfully I didn't lose them at 20 weeks, when I did give birth, one of them wasn't breathing. So she had to be taken to intensive care and she was, everything was being worked for her, you know. They kept her alive and now she's fine. But at the time, if there hadn't been a, they call it SCABU, Special Care Baby Unit, if there hadn't been one there, she wouldn't have survived. So we were... You know, we had twins. It could have been that we only had yeah. one. And so I saw, you know, this, this couple, David and Joe, wrote to me and said, 
we lost our baby. She was born asleep, they call it, born asleep. And I thought, I could have been that parent. You know, me and Steve could have been those parents. So I wanted to help them. They just did one tiny thing, one little fundraiser to raise money to buy a cold cot. It's a refrigerated cot so that the parents can spend more time with their baby, making memories, basically, photos, dress a baby. I know it sometimes sounds a bit strange, but parents deal with things in different yeah. ways and it meant they could spend longer, maybe take footprints, things like that, handprints. Um, and so I helped them with that little fundraiser. That charity since then, 15 years ago, has grown and grown and grown and now they fund whole units in hospitals wow. where parents can, it's like a suite. They can spend time with their baby. They can, um, they buy cold cots for hospitals all over the country. They fund um, training for midwives to make sure that things like happened with me don't happen yeah. again, you know. Um, and so I'm super proud to be a part of it and to support them. Well, we're going to put the link onto the video as well Thank so you. people can uh, make a donation and see how they can um, support. But Cheryl, honestly, this has just been, there's so much that you've done. I mean, I was looked at Dancing on Ice. I mean, I don't know, but why did you say yes to Dancing on Ice? Because I'd be so nerve-wracking. I mean, those bumps and falls that people well, have on there. Well, when I went for my audition, because I had to audition. You auditioned for Dancing oh, on yeah, Ice? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, everybody has to. Um, yeah, when I went for my audition, there's a guy called Mark who was one of the um, one of the back sort of back what do you call them anyway blokes that teach her how to skate yeah. and everything and uh, and he was so fabulous and he knows I adore him I really love him he's a, he's a wonderful man and um, he was the one who took me around the ice and I felt completely safe and secure with him and and I was I couldn't wipe the smile off my face I was having such a great time. Why wouldn't I want to do Dancing yeah. on Ice? And when they offered it to me, I thought, fantastic. But it was in, in, in training when I was training with, you know, not even Dan Wisdom, my partner. I was training with someone else and, um, and I had to do it on my own that I fell and I really hurt myself. I damaged my shoulder and it will never, never mend. Um, and so that was the, the fear then that, and suddenly I hated skating. But I loved doing Dancing on Ice. I loved Dan Whiston, who was my partner yeah. in it. I adored him, still do to this day. And, uh, and the heart, I loved everything about Dancing on Ice except for the skating. <laughs> Which is a bit unfortunate. Um, <laughs> what's next for you now? Obviously, we know you're still touring with The Fizz, but is there anything else that you're working on that you can kind of tell us a little bit about? I'm writing the autobiography and I will finish it. I will finish it. I will finish it. <laughs> I've done, I've practically finished it. So close. Honestly. <laughs> my mate, I went for dinner the other night with my mate and uh, she went, I said, yeah, I get up at half past six every morning. I make myself get up at half past six to work on my book. And I thought, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Actually, no, I don't want to. That's what I ought to do. Yeah. You but, going to? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cheryl, thank you so much. This has honestly been one of my favourite live stories that we've done yeah, honestly. So thank you for spending your time to be so open and so honest. Um, about and go your... on a bit. No, I do go not on a at bit. all. This has been incredible. Thank you. That's a pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone. Yay! Thank you so much. <laughs>